On behalf of the Louisiana Center for the Book in the State Library of Louisiana, thank you for joining us for this virtual 2021 Louisiana Book Festival presentation. This program is Was There a Louisiana Conspiracy in the Murder of JFK? Featuring Fred Litwin, Alicia P. Long, and Robert Mann. Fred Litwin is based in Ottawa, Canada. His newest book is On the Trail of Delusion, Jim Garrison, The Great Accuser, which exposes the New Orleans District Attorney who solved the JFK assassination in 1967. Litwin's first book was Conservative Confidential, which detailed his journey from anti-nuclear activist to gadfly on the right. I Was a Teenage JFK Conspiracy Freak, which came out in 2015, recounted his move to believing that Oswald was the lone assassin. Alicia P. Long is a professor of history at Louisiana State University and author of Cruising for Conspirators, How a New Orleans DA Prosecuted the Kennedy Assassination as a Sex Crime, and The Great Southern Babylon, Sex, Race, and Respectability in New Orleans, 1865-1920. She is a recovering New Orleanian who lives in Baton Rouge with two spoiled dogs. She blogs at aliciaplong.com. Robert Mann holds the Manship Chair in Journalism at LSU's Manship School of Mass Communication. A former political writer for Louisiana Daily Newspapers, he served as a senior aide to U.S. Senators Russell Long and John Bro and Governor Kathleen Blanco. He worked on statewide political campaigns from 1990 through 2003. From 2013 to 2018, he wrote a weekly politics column for the New Orleans Times-Picayune. Mann is the author of critically acclaimed books about the American Civil Rights Movement, the Vietnam War, the 1964 presidential election, American wartime dissent, and President Ronald Reagan. Ladies and gentlemen, Fred Litwin, Alicia Long, and Robert Mann. Hi, it's good to be with you. I'm Bob Mann, and I'll be the uh, moderator of this uh, uh, fascinating discussion between two authors about a particular uh, aspect of the uh, uh, Kennedy assassination and the, invest the uh, in ensuing investigation, uh, particularly it's uh, um, the events that happened in Louisiana, particularly New Orleans. Uh, and so I'm delighted to be here with uh, Alicia Long and, and Fred Ledwin, and um, we'll just dive right in. And uh, so I'll throw this out to, uh, to Professor Long first. Just tell us, who who is Jim Garrison? So Jim Garrison was a World War II veteran. He's a Tulane trained lawyer. Um, he worked for different law firms in the 1950s um, and has a kind of obscure career, but he wins a sort of long shot bid for district attorney of Orleans Parish in 1962. And he quickly uh, proves himself a formidable political force in the state. And by the time you get to the beginning of his uh, second term in 1966, he has essentially created a situation in the state where he has no uh, viable political opposition in the state and had helped to get Governor John McKithen elected. So he's a very powerful district attorney um, in a period of time where he begins um, an investigation in which there is virtually no oversight from anyone else in the state. Now, district attorneys in Louisiana in those days and still now were pretty powerful people. A lot of, a lot of latitude. They have an enormous amount of power in their hands. And I mean, I think there's that, you know, you can indict some, you can indict a ham sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> if he wanted to, but yes, he was a particularly powerful district attorney um, in a state where those kinds of offices wield enormous power in any case. Yeah. I think he also understood that that uh, he had enormous power and he was going to use it. Um, you know, he told people, OK, I'm going to investigate the Kennedy assassination. I'm going to really use this power in different ways. And he would he was uh, he discovered different laws that he could use. He he uh, used the grand jury system as a way of intimidating witnesses by uh, uh, subpoena them, subpoenaing them to testify and then uh, indicting them for perjury. And that would mean you have to get a lawyer, you can't travel out of the parish. Um, and then uh, ultimately he would drop the charges, but people were scared of Garrison. The, the, this assassination, going back to, the, to 1963, um, this, what were the, what was the crime? I mean, what was that was, these weren't federal crimes necessarily, were they? Well, assassination was not a federal crime at the time. And so the whole case of the assassination itself should properly have been adjudicated in Texas. Um, but of course, Oswald, uh, assassination short circuits that, 
And so there's always a weird imbalance. And I, you know, I'm sure Fred will have a comment about this too, but there's always a weird imbalance of, about what Garrison is doing because he's essentially investigating the assassination, but he's got to have sort of on the ground um, defendants involved in a conspiracy case that has its origins in New Orleans. And so he's always, there's always a sort of balancing act there and uh, that will carry through the entire trial of Clay Shaw. And I just say one more thing, then I'll let Fred add what he wants. But the conspiracy statute in Louisiana was not a very high bar to cross because you just had to have two or more people cons uh, having a conspiratorial conversation, doing something to plan something that was criminal. And then one of those people has to take an act in furtherance of that conspiracy. And whether the crime ever happened or not, um, they could then be convicted of conspiracy. So it's a pretty low legal bar, I think. Yeah, that's very true. And also, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald lived in New Orleans for five months mm -hmm. in the spring and summer of 1963. And so Garrison had this idea that if there was a conspiracy, it may have been hatched in New Orleans. And there were indeed a couple of leads. And so that's what led him to start this investigation back in uh, the fall of 1966, when there was what I would call assassination fever throughout the United States because of people like Mark Lane and Harold Weisberg. So um, I'll let either, whoever wants to, 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 to take this one and, and you can pick, the other one can pick it up. But so tell us how the case gets started. How does, how does Garrison decide to investigate the Kennedy assassination? Where does he get the idea to do that? Well, he first off, he was involved back in 1963 because there were a couple of leads in New Orleans. So there, there was the, the Dean Andrews lead, who was a lawyer who basically claimed that uh, he got a phone call from a Clay Bertrand uh, right after the assassination to go and represent Lee Harvey Oswald in Dallas. That was one lead. And the second lead was David Ferry, who was a, a former Eastern Airlines pilot who lived in New Orleans, who happened to, happened to take a trip the weekend of the assassination to Houston and Galveston um, and somewhat suspicious. Mm -hmm. And so these were sort of two leads. And in 1966, when Garrison decided to sort of relook at things, he had these two things to sort of sort of go back on. Uh, there was nothing there, but uh, it gave him sort of the ability to sort of, uh, I guess, to start to make things up in a certain way. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just add to that, that you know, these two people who told the original Assassination Weekend stories, a, a guy named Jack Martin with a fairly dubious reputation to begin with, and yep. Dean Andrews, who was uh, somebody who described him as a big talker who stretched the truth. Both of these people who told these stories told completely different stories about the alleged cast of uh, conspiratorial characters. And the only thing those stories have in common in the beginning is Lee Harvey Oswald and allegations that he's associating with homosexuals and might be homosexual himself. And over time, during Jim Garrison's investigation, those two stories get sort of merged to create a new cast of conspirators. And those conspirators are Lee Harvey Oswald and David Ferry, both of whom are now dead, and uh, Clay Bertrand. And Garrison makes the claim and tries to press a court case that Clay Shaw used Clay Bertrand as an alias and was a conspirator on those grounds. I, I think his, his, Garrison's genius was in taking those two stories and fusing them together into one uh, conspiracy story and and you know there was nothing there was absolutely nothing there in either story when you really looked at it and in fact his early investigation really came up with nothing um mm -hmm. it's really striking about i think he realized or knew there there's both of these really had nothing nothing to back them up Gar garrison you what if, i can't remember what now which one of you wrote this but you made the point that, that his his way of sort of triangulating uh, uh, creating associations with people and I'm, I'm blanking out on the specific term that he used yeah, he used the term propinquity. And so he had this sort of theory that if people had lived in proximity to one another or been in proximity to one another at a particular point, then there might be some sort of conspiratorial association. And the point I make in Cruising for Conspirators is that he is sort of using the same kind of propinquity ideology, but he's using it around gay people, um, people who at the time were referred to as homosexual. And so part of the theory of the case is that, you know, 
homosexuals um, are not just suspicious, but they're potentially uh, lethally criminal um, and that a lot of them are associating. So, I mean, today people might call it like a gay mafia ideology, but I was just trying to sort of think about uh, his, um, you know, his propinquity ideology and how that helped to explain sort of the sense that there was a conspiracy that was hatched among homosexuals who people allege all know each other in New Orleans. So it's, it's, a, it's a weird set of claims from the get-go and it's a prejudicial set of claims. He, he actually told, I think, journalist James Phelan, you know, one homosexual, okay, two homosexuals, okay, but six homosexuals, there's something there. Yeah. So, the, so, so Alicia, the, 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 the title of your book, Cruising for Conspirators, and, 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 and the actual theme of the book is that it is, that Garrison prosecuted this as a sex crime. Elaborate on that, would you please? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people have looked at the Garrison case and have, they've really looked at the Garrison case in depth and the conclusions about it tend to be, you know, very polarized that he was completely wrong and a fraud or that he was right and his prosecution was thwarted by, you know, murky federal forces. And what I wanted to do was put sexuality in the foreground of this and really look at those events through the lens of sexuality and in particular, the very perilous situation that gay people faced in Louisiana during that period of time, how um, arrests of that group of people had been growing for a decade by the time Garrison began his investigation. And so, you know, gay people had a very, uh, you know, perilous uh, legal and social position during this period of time. They were a vulnerable population. And so I just wanted to sort of think about those events and Clay Shaw's identity as a closeted gay man as a way to reanalyze the Garrison investigation, not so much to um, try to decide once and for all whether he was right or wrong, although based on my read of the evidence, he was uh, engaged in what I call staggering prosecutorial misconduct, but I wanted to think about it uh, through the lens of sexuality and what that must have been like for the gay community and for Clay Shaw in particular. Yeah, I, I, look, I have to hand it to you. Um, uh... Alicia, your, your book is groundbreaking and very, very important and a, a super impressive piece of work to analyze it in this fashion. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Everyone always likes to hear that. And I'll also say that Fred is, you know, Fred and I are interested in slightly different aspects of the Garrison investigation, but he was very generous with me with sources. And Fred has an extraordinarily broad knowledge, not just of the Garrison investigation, but the Kennedy assassination. That's a huge literature. And to get your arms around it is a very difficult thing. And it was uh, really heartening to be able to um, work with someone like Fred cooperatively on my own book and have him share sources with me. Um, and if we disagree, you know, we disagree respectfully. And I think that's a really um, important part of um, how we move forward in Kennedy assassination studies. At least I hope so. Yeah, for sure. Fred, you wrote in, in the book, uh, you said he you're just describing a garrison you're saying a date you said a, a right a dangerous mind inhabited the man who sat in the office of the new orleans da and because he couldn't find a conspiracy he made one up and in his wake many lives were broken who are who are beyond clay shaw who are some of the lives that were broken by by this investigation well it's it's quite amazing that garrison uh, several months after he indicted clay shaw he actually indicted a man in California by the name of Edgar Eugene Bradley, who was a, a radio promoter for, for Christian radio. And Garrison indicted him with absolutely no evidence just because of a couple of memos uh, that staff members had written. In fact, uh, Bradley was not in Dallas that day, he was in El Paso. Um, and so that sort of, uh, and in fact, fortunately for, for Bradley, uh, uh, Garrison wanted him extradited from California, but Ronald Reagan refused to extradite him because Garrison couldn't back up any of his evidence. So fortunately for him, uh, but that puts a little pretty crimp, a big crimp on your life dealing with uh, something like that. But other people, Carlos Bringier, who was an anti-Castro Cuban living in New Orleans, um, he sent his wife, he was so nervous about being arrested, he sent his wife to Buenos Aires to live during, the, uh, during part of a Garrison's investigation and she suffered a miscarriage. Uh, there are many people, uh, Sergio Arcacha Smith lost his job. Um, there's a whole bunch of stories like this of people who who just really suffered. Um, uh, Albo Buff, who was uh, I went with David Ferry on that trip to uh, Houston the weekend. Um, he they they offered him a bribe, and when he reported that, um, they threatened him, and um, he couldn't find a job because they 
Garrison's investigators would, would follow him and talk to any potential employer. And so he had to sign a statement that uh, he wasn't bribed. There, there's many, many of these stories and it's, it's, it's very, very sad to see. Yeah, and I'd just like to add one thing to that if I can, and that is even posthumously people were um, really treated horrifically. And I think someone like David Ferry is the prime example of that in this case, that he's alleged to be a co-conspirator. But then people went on to write books about him. Uh, Harold Weisberg wrote a book that's extraordinarily abusive of David Ferry. And, and so I think it's been it's become difficult to think about some of the people involved in this case as people and not just placeholders in a conspiracy. And so someone like David Ferry, like these other people that you mentioned, Fred, you know, Garrison used his power in a very uh, amoral fashion. And, um, you know, Clay Shaw's lawyer even argued that his uh, cancer diagnosis in the early 1970s was probably accelerated by the kind of, um, you know, pressure and uh, just, sort of damage he suffered um, as an individual who uh, was alleged to have participated in, you know, helped bring forth a conspiracy that led to the um, murder of a president. I, I should also add um, David Ferry. David Ferry was under surveillance by Garrison's staff in uh, the early part of 1967. He knew it. They also sent in agents to infiltrate his life. Uh, to sort of uh, get him to do things and say things. Um, and he was suffering. He, he, um, he was having headaches. He was having trouble walking. He thought he was suffering from encephalitis. But of course, he, he ended up having this brain aneurysm. And I'm just wondering whether the stress of Garrison's investigation helped bring on that aneurysm that eventually killed him. So what, what was the, uh, this is a question for, for both of you, was there anything about New Orleans in particular that made this possible? There were, you know, if it, if it, had, it had a guy like Garrison tried to do this in, I don't know, St. Louis or Seattle, could he have gotten away with it? Was there something particular about New Orleans that made it more uh, fertile ground for some, some kind of investigation and prosecution like this? Well, I would just say, I would sort of stretch that out in one way politically which is that you know, Louisiana is a state that has um, lodged a lot of executive power in its governor. And so we've had extremely powerful governors. And this also, I think, filters down to attorneys general and district attorneys. And so you sort of have these uh, you know, uh, regional power holders, somebody like Leander Perez or this sort of thing, like people who just become um, sort of dominant in their given area, Harry Lee, the sheriff in Jefferson Parish. You know, we have a history in this state of these kind of very powerful and often demagogic uh, leaders. And so I think, you know, and then state's politics facilitate that in certain ways. And so I think Garrison in a certain way fits into that larger pattern of very powerful uh, people who are willing to exert their power and stretch it as far as they can in the history of the state, way beyond what the uh, letter of the law suggests they can do. And, I, and I'll say just briefly, because I'm sure Fred has something to say about this too, but I just think, you know, New Orleans is a place that is sort of given over to magical thinking, <laughs> fantastical thinking. And, and so I think, you know, a lot of the things that Garrison was alleging, um, you know, feed into this sort of uh, fantastical noir quality that's associated with the French Quarter uh, during these years in a broader cultural way. So I think there are at least two ways that that's the case, I don't know, hand it off. I think, I think Garrison also played into mistrust of the federal government um, that a lot of people in Louisiana felt. And the other thing, just uh, what Professor Long said, uh, people in New Orleans, I think, like to be entertained. And Garrison was entertaining and, and uh, he provided headlines every day. He was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the news, he sold a lot of newspapers for the state's item and the Times Picayune. Um, he was good business. And so I think New Orleans appreciated that, New Orleans people. Well, so, you know, uh, in 2021 and in the 20th century, uh, 21st century, people think of New Orleans as, you know, a place where anything goes and that where, you know, there is a, um, a vibrant um, a gay culture down there where people are welcomed, where this is a city that, that welcomes people who might not, you know, fit in in their, their small towns, but they, they find a place in New Orleans. What, to what extent did that exist in the 60s? Well, you know, I would just say that I had to teach myself a lot about the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination, but also about the history of gay people 
in New Orleans and Gaiman in particular is the population that I was looking at. And as that population becomes more visible in the post-World War II era um, and increasing numbers of gay people are drawn to the French Quarter, you get the sort of backlash from conservative reformers. And so for instance, this guy named Richard Foster, um, you know, a self-appointed and then mayoral appointed reformer in the city undertakes to make homosexuality less visible in the French Quarter. And he's quoted in the newspaper saying something like, it almost seems like um, who, people who develop homosexual tendencies in their hometowns are put on a train and sent to New Orleans. And so he's sort of explaining how the French Quarter sort of becomes an attractive place, but he wants to push back on this. And he and some other like-minded reformers really push the city to tighten its alcohol uh, beverage licensing of uh, and uh, ordinances so that it makes it difficult for gay people to work in bars, particularly if they're gender non-conforming, makes it difficult for gay people to gather, uh, makes it hard for people to rent apartments if they are openly gay. I mean, and the state legislature, not surprisingly, gets in on this <laughs> and supports it. And so by the early 1960s, you do have a pretty um, perilous situation for gay people, which the police, who surprisingly were kind of reluctantly uh, you know, brought along into doing this, begin to uh, arrest gay people at escalating rates. And so, you know, uh, raiding gay bars becomes extremely common in the 1960s. And so this is all, you know, a process that took place. And so we should not oversimplify, you know, New Orleans as the always happy, gay friendly place, because that has not always been the case. And I think uh, Alicia's book really demonstrates that uh, gay people be, sort of leading double lives, you know, out maybe in the in the evening in the closet during the day, were easy targets for Garrison to uh, to to force them to become informants and to go after them and to uh, there was a lot of issues of of perhaps uh, was there a systematic uh, abuse of gay people to to, to shake them down for money etc. A lot of there, Garrison realized the power of his office. Um, and that could be used against gay people. Yeah, and he had this fixer. I'll just say this, he had this fixer, his uh, chief investigator named Pershing Gervais, who is a fascinating and another amoral character in the story. But Gervais is documented to have accepted bribes. And so, you know, the evidence for sort of, uh, you know, bribing gay people a class as a class is scant, but it is there. And bribery is documented uh, in Garrison's office. And uh, I spoke to Milton Brenner, who wrote a great book called The Garrison Case, and he worked in Garrison's office, and he said one of the things that Pershing Gervais did was he would find out which cases were not being prosecuted, and then he would go to those people and shake them down for money um, because he knew they wouldn't be prosecuted, and he would come across as this guy who actually got things done. That was one of his techniques. Yeah. What was the... Um... Who pushed back on this in the media or in the local or state politics? Did anyone at the time try to stop it uh, in any way? You know, there were writers who within the first few months of the investigation, of Garrison's investigation becoming public, which happens in February of 1967, um, who write series of stories that are critical of what he's doing. And I'm thinking of Hugh Ainsworth who was a you know, well-known uh, Texas journalist who was working for Newsweek at this time. So there are some people who write articles critical of Garrison uh, in those first few months, but a lot of um, you know, newspapers, even those that are kind of considered unfriendly to him are like Fred pointed out, sort of moving along with the momentum of the story and Garrison keeps the spectacle moving. <laughs> and so there's enough press coverage that even if you know, some of it is negative, um, this thing stays in the news for two years. And if it, you know, if there's a lull, lo and behold, a new development <laughs> takes place. Um, so, you know, and, and the New Orleans newspapers, um, frankly, um, stood to the side and um, reported, but don't take a firm position. Um, they're, you know, they're scattered editorials, but they don't really take a firm position until after uh, Clay Shaw is found not guilty, and then they sort of say he should resign. Uh, but it's it takes it's a long time coming. Even there were even uh, two reporters, Hope May and Ross Yockey, who were uh, working for the state's item, who were basically working for Garrison. They're writing memos for Garrison. They're helping him with his investigation. And it was only when people like Gervich and and some of Clay Shaw's attorneys, and, and along with um, the Met Aaron Cohen of the Metropolitan Crime Commission, actually went to uh, I think George Healy 
and said, look, these guys are, uh, are not the, the kind of journalists you want covering the case. They were then removed, but that shows how cozy some of these reporters were with Garrison. What was the national press coverage like? Pretty, pretty ho hostile. And I would say a lot of people, you know, here you have this man, Garrison, very charismatic. Uh, a lot of people like James Phelan and Hugh Ainsworth, who actually liked him and really wanted to listen to his story. But everybody realized, uh, Merriman Smith was another one who realized after you listen to him, he's, he's crazy. This is this whole conspiracy is, is nuts, doesn't make sense. And so uh, the national press quite rightly was was horrified at what was going on in New Orleans. Yeah, and NBC, I think it does a special uh, in the summer of 1967, and it's actually available on YouTube. People can watch it now, but it's extraordinarily critical of Garrison's case. And just some of the witnesses that they bring forth sort of show what's underway in New Orleans, and Garrison was furious about that and actually tried to take legal action against some of the people involved in that documentary. Um, but if you watch it um, and then watch his response to it on television, I think you get a good flavor of what's happening. <laughs> In New Orleans, uh, on the pro-Garrison and anti-Garrison side, uh, as of the late as of late 1967, did anyone from did any members of or staff of the Warren Commission um, have anything to say about this at the time? Well, well actually, they tried to get Wesley Liebler to to uh, testify uh, in New Orleans before the grand jury and. Uh, uh, that never happened. I, I think, look, one of the sad things for me following the Kennedy assassination, the Warren Commission, a lot of its members were quite silent. Um, there was, you know, this big brouhaha with Mark Lane and Harold Weisberg, assassination fever, and a few of them were out there debating like Wesley Liebler, but the, the members of the commission were, were quite silent, didn't say much, and they did not do a good job of defending uh, the Warren Commission's uh, work in the Kennedy assassination. And in fact, there were several legitimate questions um, that needed to be answered. In particular, the medical evidence was uh, not well uh, well investigated by the Warren Commission. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, uh, the defenders, um, there weren't very many good defenders of, of, of the Warren report um, when Garrison was running around with Mark Lane. You know, I also think though, in, in a way, that situation mirrors some of our own contemporary situation, where there's a sort of, um, a sort of feeling that if you give these people oxygen, you know, if you give people like Mark Lane oxygen or Jim Garrison oxygen, if you give them press coverage, you're just going to make them a bigger story. And I'm, I'm not comparing apples, apples, oranges, oranges to, uh, to Garrison and, and Donald Trump. But this is a, this is also a dilemma the media had when you're dealing with a demagogic personality who's making these kinds of outrageous claims constantly. Do you try to oppose every claim that is made or do you sort of just step back and trust that the system will work? And, <coughs> excuse me, um, I think that was a real dilemma, um, not just for the media, but, you know, for the, I think, quite serious minded people who were on the Warren Commission, you know, who cared about their own reputations and futures. A lot of those lawyers were very young and starting out and they were, you know, obviously well-educated lawyers. And I think they didn't want to get in the mud with people like Garrison. And, and I understand what you're saying. I don't disagree with you, Fred, but I also yeah. think, you know, these people had their own reasons for um, yeah. moving on. No, absolutely correct. I think also Garrison, in a certain sense, liked the, the fact that the national press was against them. It was, it was more proof of the CIA control of the media. It all fed into this, this world model of, of, uh, massive uh, government intervention against people who, uh, like him, who actually knew the truth. Yeah, and the CIA comments on this right? I me mean, very specifically, and I talk about this in the book, they're like, you know, yeah. the FBI doesn't want to talk to him, the CIA doesn't want to talk to him because they believe this is just going to help sort of uh, enlarge his claims about the culpability of our agencies. Yeah. We've already uh, alluded to this, but um, it wasn't, these weren't federal crimes that were being uh, investigated or prosecuted, but what what did the FBI did the, did the feds have any role in in this? Were they interested? Did, was there any intervention by anybody on the federal level to either uh, help Garrison or to slow him down? Well, uh, there were there were Clay Shaw's attorneys went to Washington. They wanted to speak to people in the CIA. They wanted to speak to people in the FBI, and they did. And they wanted help. They, they, you know, Garrison was making all these claims about people working for the CIA and being involved with the CIA, and and 
Garrison's attorney, I mean, Clay Shaw's attorneys were put in this unfortunate situation of almost re doing their own investigation of the Kennedy assassination, which they should never have been required to do. So they wanted help, and the CIA did not want to get involved. Um, there are several memos where they said, look, we'd love to help you guys, but we can't do it. We don't want to make public statements. We don't want to get mired in the muck, and the FBI the same way. Um, and in fact, the FBI had some evidence that Garrison was involved in some fraud related to his National Guard service. And the memo quite clearly says we will not, even though there's some good evidence, we'll not investigate this further because we don't want to really get involved with Jim Garrison and make him give him the ammunition to say that we're interfering with what he's doing. Yeah. Those intelligence agencies were very interested in what was happening in New Orleans, yeah. particularly the CIA, because it's being consistently smeared. Um, and it, you know, it does turn out that in the 1950s, Clay Shaw did have uh, an informal uh, role in uh, something called the Domestic Contact Service when he returned from foreign travels to sort of uh, having a debrief with CIA um, agents in New Orleans. And he does deny that uh, during the period of his trial. I think I understand and try to explain why he did that um, during the period of his trial. But, um, you know, there was an extant relationship and, um, you know, this has also created an enormous amount of fodder for people who want to defend Garrison's investigation and see something, um, you know, uh, fundamental um, in that um, in that set of facts. Another very big story that I cover in my book is right after Clay Shaw was indicted, there was a series of articles in a communist-controlled newspaper in Rome, Paese Sera which talked about Clay Shaw's membership on the board of a World Trade Center in Rome. He was on the board and they, they painted um, the World Trade Center in Rome as a CIA front to funnel money to right-wing extremists. And therefore Shaw had the CIA, big CIA connection. Uh, none of it was true. And what I talk about in my book, uh, which is I think very important is one of the people targeted in those articles was a lawyer from Montreal, Louis Bloomfield, who represented several shareholders in that World Trade Center. And I've gone through his papers in Ottawa, thousands and thousands of pages of his letters, many to people who are running the World Trade Center. And there's nothing there except the fact that this World Trade Center failed in 1962 because they couldn't get enough tenants. There was nothing nefarious about the organization, but that led to another reason why Clay Shaw could not admit any any uh, relationship with the CIA because it would have been misused by Garrison saying, well, you see, look what happened in Rome. Yeah. And we can't hear you, Bob. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. You were about to make a, you were about to make a point. I, you know, I think I just said, you know, it's, it's, you know, another sort of correlation with our time. It's very easy to make accusations. And once accusations are out in the culture, once they have some you know, wind behind them, even if they're not true, I mean, they're out there in the body politic, you know, especially if you just want to say, well, I'm just saying this is a possibility, you know, and there's, there's a lot of that stuff that kind of went out into the ether during the garrison investigation that hung in the air, um, even though it was, there was no foundation for it. If you look closely, and I mean, I, I think Fred in the, in the case of Bloomfield has done that. I mean, that person has been smeared for decades as a person who's somehow, you know, deeply mired in conspiracy. And, and Fred has shown that this is a, you know, a very benign, uh, you know, commercial lawyer, corporate lawyer who was uh, working away, but just gets, you know, an accusation is made and then it takes on a life of its own. Yeah, and you see that today. I mean, Bloomfield actually did a lot of charitable work. He started the World Wildlife Fund in Canada. Um, and today, if you go online and look at his biographies online, it all talks about his membership in the OSS, not true, and his potential relationship in the JFK assassination. It's very, very sad to see somebody maligned that way, and it still sticks decades later. Alicia, you wrote, um, or you alluded to the fact that um, that Garrison had a reputation for, um, and not, you know, not the, the, that the misconduct clearly wasn't um, confined to this to this particular case. That he used his political office to punish a political opponents and just people he didn't like. So um, this was a this was a pattern for him before and and after. Yeah, and I thought that was why it was really important to um, look at his first term and to think about um, actions that he undertook. Because I think, you know, as a historian, I think it's important to understand the longer arc of issues. And if you look at the longer arc of his time as a district attorney, 
a pattern is set in which he will make inflammatory charges and sort of uh, misuse people if it advances some sort of personal or political goal of his. And so I think by the time you get to Clay Shaw's uh, prosecution, arrest and then prosecution, there's already ample evidence of that kind of activity having you know, emerged from his office, some of it in testimony in a court of law and, and, and pretty good evidence that he had perjured himself um, in a case in, in the late 1950s. And so, you know, I think, you know, we need to consider that larger pattern when we uh, make an assessment of his investigation of the Kennedy assassination and his prosecution of Clay Shaw, which, by the way, his office lost. <laughs> And Clay Shaw was found not guilty. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's as with Bloomfield, um, you know, that has not ever wiped away um, the suspicion or accusations that he was an active conspirator in the Kennedy assassination. And that is that has remained part of his legacy. And that is part of the reason that I wanted to write this book and give what I think is a very fair um, historical assessment of those events that uh, foregrounds thinking about it through the lens of sexuality. That, that, that's really true, and and uh, Garrison's uh, technique was basically to to indict and then find the evidence after you indict, and if you can't find the evidence, and blame it on the CIA. That's the standard operating procedure for Garrison. He also had a sort of commitment to something called like the world of should be, right? <laughs> and he was willing to use his office um, to create outcomes that he felt were the right outcomes. Um, but that is not necessarily how the law is supposed to work, right? I mean, it's a sort of a reverse engineering of the way law enforcement is supposed to work. Um, we know it doesn't always, but you know, there is there's a principled set of ways that it's supposed to work. What did Garrison, what do you think Garrison wanted from this investigation beyond a conviction of Clay Shaw and, and the rights to say he solved the Kennedy assassination? What, what, what were his what were his political ambitions? Well, I think his political ambitions grew with time, but I also think, I mean, I, I think he liked being in the national spotlight. I think he did believe in a conspiracy in the assassination. And I think he liked being a sort of um, a very prominent member of the assassination conspiracy community. That was a very uh, you know, prominent community of uh, writers and, uh, you know, people during this period of time and they had you know people who really wanted to hear what they had to say so he becomes a national figure but i think in the aftermath in particular you know he had wanted since the 1950s to be a writer and had been trying to write and so his success as a published author comes as a result of that investigation into the kennedy assassination despite the fact that he lost the case that he pressed and and over time you know, he publishes three books and that third book on the trail of the assassins is his best book if you're just thinking about it in terms of you know stylistic and sort of narrative structure. He got better at being a writer over time, but you know the downside of that is he was able to make a you know a more convincing case um, for what he had been doing, even though he like almost entirely represents the order of things in which they took place. And then of course uh, you know Oliver Stone options that book and makes the movie JFK sort of create you know keeping those cultural um, swirls going. There's a bit of a tragedy, I think, here for, for Jim Garrison. After David Ferry died, uh, his staff members went to him and said, you know what, you can now drop the case. You could drop the case. You'll be a hero. Your suspect died. You were on the way to finding out who killed Kennedy. You can go on to bigger things. And he said, no way. This is the crime of the century, and I'm going to solve it. And the tragedy here is that he could have gone on to bigger and better things. He could have become governor or senator. Um, he had everything going for him for higher political office. And I think the assassination fever just ruined it for him. There was uh, there were aspects of uh, Garrison's um, psyche, his, his emotional health uh, that, that, that uh, you explored. I'll elaborate a little bit on that. This was not I mean, we, I think it's a manifestly evident this was not a stable man, but you, I think, Alicia, you got into that a little bit, didn't you? Yeah, you know, I try to stay away from there. There are so, you know, he has a, a military record that was made public around this time, and it does suggest some psychological difficulties um, in the 1950s. And, you know, there's another published book which uh, suggests, you know, more definite um, mental health diagnoses and, and treatment by a psychiatrist. I, you know, whether or not he was mentally ill, he still did 
terrible things as a public official. And so, you know, I think I, I didn't I didn't want to focus on it because I didn't think it was that important to my argument. But certainly, um, you know, yes, there is evidence of psychiatric difficulties. And when you have a person who's that powerful, um, that is something that is, you know, certainly people who opposed him wrote about this quite freely and suggested that this ought to be made more public because he was a very dangerous and mentally uh, ill person with a very powerful office. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, he, he the, you know, there there are signs of, of mental illness, but regardless, he did some really awful things. I want to I want to turn to um, Oliver Stone for a moment here because this this is where most people who are you know maybe most people who are watching this or who most people who know about this case know it through the lens of Oliver Stone's telling, which was a retelling of Jim Garrison's version of the case, right? So, um, what what. I don't know if, if the word damage is the right word to, to use, or what damage did Oliver Stone do to people's understanding of, of, of all this? And do you, do you feel like that you're pushing a, a, a boulder uphill trying to undo some of that? Yeah, well, I think, you know, Garrison, I think, would have uh, been a minor figure in the whole assassination business, if not for Oliver Stone. His book was destined to be a nothing book, but Oliver Stone sort of brought it up and made it into a big bestseller, uh, brought him to the national stage in a massive way through JFK and made Garrison into this crusading hero. Um, it was all, all false and all ridiculous, but um, uh, Oliver Stone has a lot to answer for um, in what he did. And at the time of the film, people forget that there were, there were demonstrations against, against the film, uh, the gay lesbian action against discrimination, uh, Defamation was was very angry with with the, the film, um, and they met with Oliver Stone and the Advocate wrote uh, two two articles about how the how the film was homophobic, but importantly, it wasn't just that the film was homophobic, but it was that Jim Garrison's investigation had homophobic overtones, and as Celicia has written, which is so important to understand. You know, we're at the thirtieth anniversary of JFK. And which, you know, it posits a sort of sprawling conspiracy, but it uses Shaw and this alleged New Orleans based group of conspirators to sort of like uh, soften people up to the idea that there's this broader conspiracy. And of course, these like over the top, uh, stereotypical uh, portrayals of gay men are part of the characterization methodology of that movie. And you can't you can't deny that. Um, uh, and I don't think those things have aged well. <laughs> Um, 30 years down the road. And, you know, uh, Stone now has a, you know, a, a, a documentary coming out um, that's revisiting some of these same questions. And, and, you know, I just happen to think it's worth revisiting some of these questions, but I think we can also move forward because there's ample evidence that the Garrison investigation and prosecution was corrupt. And we can, uh, and Fred has provided an enormous amount of it in On the Trail of Delusion, and it, people can resist that if they like, um, but I think we can move on to new kinds of questions and new ways of thinking about these things. Um, and, you know, in part, we have such a big body of evidence um, related to the assassination because of the aftermath of Stone's movie, JFK. And I don't think that makes up for the ways in which it did cultural damage, particularly to LGBT people. Um, but now there's this humongous archive because of the 1992 Kennedy assassination of Michael Jacks, which you know followed in the wake of that film, um, in part because of its very specious arguments and betrayals. And that's an irony that's worth thinking about. Um, but we can use those records to ask all kinds of questions and do all kinds of interesting uh, scholarship about the 1960s and after. And so, you know, as a historian, I hope we can begin to move in new directions, and not just keep, um, you know, adjudicating the same questions over and over, particularly when there are satisfying, reliable answers out there. And, um, you know, Fred has provided a great many of them. Well, I want to ask uh, one or both of you uh, about a particular aspect of Stone's story that was um, that that also Russell Long related to me when I wrote my biography of him, and that was his his involvement in in uh, either uh, planting or encouraging uh, a, a garrison to pursue this case. What well, do you the story the, the story is that they were on a plane together, and Russell Long was talking to Garrison about the uh, 
uh, the, the Warren Report and the deficiencies of the Warren Report. And this is when Mark Lane and all those other people were, were discussing, uh, uh, analyzing the 26 volumes of evidence. And, and, um, and supposedly that is, you know, when Garrison decided to uh, uh, himself buy the, the Warren Report and its evidence and go through it. I'm not sure how, how accurate that is, because I, I think one of the things that really um, Garrison did was he, he, he was greatly influenced by Har- Harold Weisberg. And Alicia goes through a lot of this in her book on his uh, Weisberg's book, Oswald in New Orleans, but also there was his book Whitewash. And I think that's where Garrison learned for the first time that Dean Andrews had actually backed off um, his uh, his his uh, story. Initially, it backed off his story about Clay Bertrand saying it was a figment of his imagination. And then he testified before the Warren Commission. I think that's when Garrison learned that he testified and still believed in this story. And that's when Garrison had to go see Dean Andrews and say, what's going on with the story? Tell me what's behind it. Uh, so Russell Long may have been one of the people who contributed to it, but I think there, there's a lot more to that, to that story. Yeah, and Bob, you know, what I think is fascinating about that, and it's much more sort of, you know, inside baseball Louisiana story, but of course, Russell Long's father, Huey Long, was killed and allegedly assassinated. Um, and I think the Long family position was that it had been a, you know, a cabal, a conspirator of, of his political opponents who had um, sort of, um, you know, pushed Carl Weiss to do this. And so I just think that's sort of this interesting kind of connection where, you know, he's the son of an assassinated political figure. And in, then in another way, and this is probably a little too literary, but then also the sort of the father of another, you know, assassination uh, conspiracy investigation. And so, you know, to the degree that that is true. I, I think there's, you know, again, another longer arc story, which makes it even more interesting. Yeah. Well, you, you alluded to, Fred, the, you know, the Warren, the, you know, the, the Long's, uh, the, 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 at least the conversation with Long may have, may have sparked Garrison's interest in the, in the Warren Commission report. And I guess I, the question I have is, did, what, what, to what extent did the Warren, did the deficiencies of the Warren Commission report uh, make it provide Garrison with fertile ground for what he did. If the Warren Commission report had been, um, a, 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 had done, if the Warren Commission had done a better job, would Garrison have been possible? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think the, the, the main deficiency from my perspective is that the Warren Commission never hired a team of forensic pathologists to look at the autopsy, x-rays, and photographs of Kennedy. Had they done that, they would have had a, a firm report in their hands about the location of the wounds, the nature of the wounds, the fact whether they're entrance or exit wounds, um, and nobody could have argued about where were the wounds. Um, they didn't do this, and they, that led to people questioning the medical evidence. The other thing the Warren Commission didn't do was they didn't do a really firm um, analysis of the Zapruder film. And so the fact that people like Jim Garrison and others can go and talk about the head snap in frame 13 and afterwards, you know, back into the left, back into the left, well, the Warren Commission never addressed that. They never discussed it. They never explained why did Kennedy's head move backwards after the fatal shot. There's some very good explanations, but they didn't provide them. And that, again, led great fodder to people like Mark Lane and Harold Weisberg. Yeah, I would also, and I slightly disagree. I mean, I, you know much more about those very specific kinds of issues than I do, so I would not argue with you on those. But, you know, I just think it's Oswald's assassination that really creates the situation where you're never really going to have satisfying answers. And because the Warren Commission uh, report is so sprawling, there's an enormous amount of counter evidence, even in the uh, material that they accumulate in those accessory volumes. And so should you wish to ask questions, there are questions to ferret out. And so because there was never a satisfying trial of the assassin, I think there were always questions were always going to remain open. And even though, you know, other commissions have looked at these questions, there's no uh, sort of absolutely dispositive answers to many of the open questions. And so in some ways they did have a Sisyphean task. And even though I think they tried to do it as well as they could, the effort was probably doomed from the start. Yeah. And I'd also add that Lyndon Johnson gave them a an impossible task of finishing by September 1964, well before the election. So they gave them uh, not a long time to do an awful lot of work. And and then they were through and finished and they were and questions arise and there was nobody there to answer 
uh, any of these questions. Are there are there documents that what 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 about the assassination of Kennedy? Do we not know that may still be um, where that we may still be um, we might we may find out new information from documents that are still being um, uh, held under uh, seal by the National Archives or some or someone else? Is there anything is, is there anything more up for us to learn from the documentary evidence? I think we'll learn more about the Cold War when some of these documents are released because uh, all the major documents regarding the assassination itself have been released. Uh, the only documents that are left um, with redactions or not public are those related to informants or sensitive intelligence uh, methods. And so we'll learn more about the Cold War. But I want to add where we really could learn more about documents is if Moscow released its documents on the Kennedy assassination. The documents that Moscow has uh, will shed light on KGB operations um, to influence American public opinion that the CIA was behind the Kennedy assassination. I've documented at least three KGB operations. There might have been more, and I'd like to know what's in those files in Moscow. Yeah, I, I think, you know, documents can be used in any number of ways, and people can sort of frame new questions out of this thing. There's not the holy grail in those documents. Right? There's not going to be a firm identification of additional shooters. And those kinds of questions are always uh, going to stay open. And people are going to adjudicate them because they're fascinated by them or, you know, um, they're determined to prove something that's not provable. And I'm just of a more practical mind in that, you know, we have this great archive. And there, there's enormously good material to be written about the CIA and about civil rights and about the Cold War and about you know, 1960s culture and society. And there are the ingredients to do all of that in that archive because you know, there are always going to be open questions about this enormous American tragedy. Um, and of, of course we think of it like that, but you know, Clay Shaw's prosecution was also a tragedy. <laughs> and uh, that's one we're thinking about. So um, wrapping up, I'd like to just uh, uh, sort of get, let, let you both sort of tie a bow on this discussion by um, just talking about just, you know, sort of whatever you want to say about your book, uh, sort of what it's you, uh, the way I put it, what's your neat, unique selling proposition for someone who wants to learn more about this? What will your book uh, uh, tell them? How, what will they learn about this, this episode? Greg, go ahead. Well, you know, what I really wanted to focus on in my book is not just the tragedy of Clay Shaw, which was an enormous tragedy, but on the other stories about Jim Garrison and the other people that he went after in his JFK assassination investigation, he went after many other people and those stories I tell, but also when the House Select Committee on Assassinations did its second investigation in the late 70s, they went to Jim Garrison and they asked him, well, well, what leads do you have? And he wrote a series of memos, around 10 to 12 memos about his leads, his suspects, for the House Select Committee on Assassinations, and these are the most ridiculous of memos. You've got to read them. I put them a lot on my blog. Um, they were just crazy, crazy suspects, uh, ridiculous leads, mostly rumors. And what I find most interesting is that when his book comes out in 1991, on the trail of the assassins, or 89, um, none of those suspects are in his book. He left them all out. Fred Chrisman, Clyde Johnson, uh, Thomas Beckham, a whole list of people whose stories I tell where Garrison was convinced they were involved, they're not in his book. And so what's not in his book is actually more interesting than what's in his book, which of course is ridiculous. So I tell all of those stories in my book and bring it up to date um, with the latest research um, uh, on the primary documents of Jim Garrison. Are they I think what I was trying to do in Cruising for Conspirators is look at this Garrison investigation from a new perspective. And what I hope a new generation of readers of this book, particularly LGBT readers, um, will begin to see is that, you know, uh, Clay Shaw's story is very relevant to LGBT history. And it's been sort of, um, it's not in the mainstream of that part of American history, I think because of its sort of close association with the Kennedy assassination. And that in itself is, is, you know, a sort of a tragic outcome of what happened there. And so I'd like Shaw's story to get more um, scrutiny and attention as an important part of LGBT history. 
um, but then also just sort of make a sort of general argument for um, asking new questions of this old evidence. And then finally, I hope I've told a good story. Um, and I hope yeah. it's um, exciting to read. And um, because that was an important value to me is trying to um, write it in a register that just regular old people could understand. <laughs> um, because that's, you know, that's what we like to do is uh, help people think about uh, historians like to make um, historical events accessible. And I hope I've done that. You did. In fact, your prose in, in telling the story of David Ferry and Dean Andrews after uh, the early part of the, the investigation is just incredible. You make it sound so exciting. Uh, even somebody like me who knows the answer to what's happening, I couldn't, I, I, I just couldn't wait to read the whole thing because uh, your writing is impeccable. Well, we did not pre-plan that. <laughs> but thank you very much. I'll take that compliment. <laughs> Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you both for producing really uh, fascinating, gripping stories about the, the, the different perspectives of the same of the same events. And thank you for a wonderful discussion. And I wish you both the best of luck with your with your books and your future research. Thank you very much. And it's been quite an honor to be part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching this presentation of the virtual 2021 Louisiana Book Festival. Please visit our official bookseller, Cavalier House Books, and receive 20% off all featured festival titles through the end of the year. A special thank you to our festival sponsors. The Louisiana Book Festival will return on October 29th, 2022.